comic book lounge and gallery's first anniversary party, it's now time for On the Couch with Ty Templeton. Woo! And at this time, it is my distinguished and honored pleasure to introduce the man himself. Here he is, Ty Templeton. Come on up. I'm, gonna, I'm probably not going to need this, but apparently they're recording this, so I have to speak into this. So if you do that, uh, today the, the premise of On the Couch is, uh, as it says, uh, we like to get comic book artists on the couch and reveal their dreams about their mother that are erotic and things of that nature. <laughs> so uh, we're going to bring out three creators for you today to talk about uh, the sort of stuff that happens behind the scenes. I always say, if you ever go to a comic convention and you watch a uh, convention panel, those are fun. But the restaurant after the panel where the, where the pros all talk to each other, that's the stuff that's really fun. So we hope today to get at least one or two of us career-ending stories being told out loud. And uh, to bring them all out, we're going uh, to start off with Jim Subkovich, creator of Skull Kickers. Uh, following that, we have Richard Pace, who wishes to be introduced as the man with a fabulous singing voice. And uh, creator of the of the delightful and gigantic graphic novel Ragmop, Rob Walton. Bring up. Okay, come on in. Uh, guys, you're going to need to grab uh, two microphones between the three of you. So as I said, when we do the Beatles harmonies, two people have to lean into one microphone as we do it. Uh, today, the subject matter we're dealing with is the idea, and the, these three creators are chosen for a specific reason, uh, collaboration versus control. This business is all about... Uh, uh, you know, uh, working with other people or sitting in a basement by yourself and hang in the middle. And they, they we're looking to try to find a couple of answers from these guys about which they prefer. So I'm going to start with you, Jim. Okay. You have both written for other artists to draw and right. drawn from other writers' scripts and done it all yourself. Yeah. Talk to me about which of those three processes you prefer. Why? Let's go. Um, I mean, it's really evolved over the years. I've been working with the Udon Studio since 2003, and I started there as an artist, and then I moved into more of kind of a managerial role, and now I'm doing writing almost uh, all the time. So I'm working, collaborating with artists. I'm writing the stories and the scripts, and then they're doing the hard work. They're doing the illustrating. <laughs> so they're busting their butt on this stuff. So. If you're doing more writing now than, than art, is right. this something that you've slid into intentionally, or is you being dragged here accidentally? Um, I, I don't know that it was an accident. Now that it, once it started um, happening, once the, a few opportunities came up, uh, I tried to make the most of it. I really do enjoy it. I, I quite prefer it, actually. So the collaborative process for me is a blast. I love working so with... So you prefer collaboration. I you do. would, you would rather it. say, I'm going to write this and then you come back with new information and new stuff on the page. That's exciting yeah. to you as well. Yeah, and I like also bouncing stuff off of an artist and being able to uh, develop something that's a bit of both of us, that we're both putting our ideas you know, into it. I think that it makes it stronger. Do you have an example of a, of a special moment that you said, I wrote, you know, special. three guys fight each other and <laughs> I got back this fantastic <laughs> sequence? Uh -huh. Um... I was trying to think of a specific example. Uh, the book I'm probably known best for right now is, uh, is Skull Kickers at Image, which is, if you guys haven't read it, you should. Yes, I'm read it I'm a little now. biased, but <laughs> it's uh, basically like a buddy cop movie meets Conan the Barbarian. It's very deep. Which, is, <laughs> which was a buddy cop movie, because yeah, yeah. was his buddy. Yeah, there you go. So it's sort of like uh, two <laughs> monster hunting mercenaries get themselves in big trouble and constantly have to kill their way out. And so um, working with uh, Edwin, he, and he's right out of... Um, Right out of art school, he went to uh, New York College of Art, I think. He, uh, in, uh, this is his first uh, gig's created of art school? First so you don't have to pay him? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a creator own book. No one gets paid. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but the good thing is, is that um, when we first started working together, I was bouncing ideas off him, or I was being very, very, you know, that control kind of freak about it, because he was trying to learn the ropes, and I was trying to make sure that it was going to come out the way that I thought in my head. And... I think with each issue, we've gotten better and better at that. So in one of the upcoming issues, we've got uh, one of the characters is, is very, very dead. And so we've gone to the land of the dead, and we're showing like uh, you know where, where the 
the dead people go in the storyline. And I didn't say anything. I just said, yeah, show a bunch of corpses, you know, lined up to get into the halls of the dead or whatever. And he went back through every single issue and found every single person these jerks had killed and put them in the line, winding their way wow. towards the door. And you know, and if it's you told him to do that, yeah. he'd have threatened Oh, he'd have hated that, that right? <laughs> but, and he's got, he's got a dead squirrel on someone's shoulder because they killed a squirrel in one issue. There's goblins, there's giants, there's all these different guys. And he just went through meticulously and put them all in there. And when I got it, I was like, one of those things where I went, I should have thought of that. But I didn't have to because he put it right in there. And you get paid like you thought of it. Yeah, and they'll be like, Jim, that was a great thing you did. <laughs> and no, no one will believe yeah. it's his idea, too. So we've if ruined only that. we don't record it, then no one will ever know. <laughs> Richard, uh, you have, uh, obviously, uh, much like Jim, you've done the same thing. You've written for other artists and, and uh, uh, had other writers write for you. Uh, which do you prefer? And uh, let's hear a couple of your experiences with that. Uh, I actually prefer to write for other people. You prefer writing for other people? Yeah. We're both lazy. <laughs> Fundamentally. What the hell? Okay, uh, but that was a very quick answer, and this is a little bit. <laughs> so no, you just you know, elaborate on that. Simple, no, nothing, no answers to go with yes. Ask why? Okay, I'm asking why. Why? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Rob? No. <laughs> Sing for us, Richard. Same question. <laughs> Five syllables for the win. Five syllables. Um, no, the, the real reason is, is uh, when I'm drawing something, I have an idea what it's going to look like, and then I draw it. Regardless if I wrote it or another writer has written it and I'm drawing it, whatever I draw is going to fall short of what is in my head. No matter how long I spend on the piece, it's never going to be exactly as amazing as I thought it was going to be when I first first had the idea for what I'm going to draw. If I'm writing for someone else and then I see what was in their head, there's something a little bit more magical about that. Now, is this because, like all artists do, we all have self-loathing about our own work? I mean, oh, I if, if, if at any point you're ever satisfied with your work, stop working, because you, you're never yeah, going right. to yeah. Yeah. So my question is, is that just because you don't like Richard Pace as an artist? or And I, I didn't mean that to be goofy. I mean, just that Richard Pace is not your favorite artist to work with. Does he call uh, names? <laughs> I, 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 think, I think Richard Pace is a fine artist in terms of... So do I. So thank you. I've but worked he, with he, Richard Pace once or twice. I know he's an asshole. <laughs> um, and he'll do a serviceable job compared to Richard Pace's imagination. <clears throat> but there's always going to be that disappointment that oh, that's all there is. Hmm. So, bit, so we are getting on the couch stuff. Don't tell us yeah. about uh, Rob. She's short, <laughs> strangely uh, same, hairy. Same question. This is this is obviously the dating game. So same question. <laughs> Bachelor number three. Yeah. By the way, I loathe your work as well. So, um, one of us gets to leave with him <laughs> and pay the lady. <laughs> yeah. uh, first of all, I want to qualify my answer by saying that I consider myself a writer who draws. And so when it comes to collaborations, I have a file folder of scripts that I will never draw because they're beyond my, cabil uh, my, cability. <laughs> my capability to draw and speak. Um, uh, so in, when it comes to collaboration, I have two views. Uh, there's, this, there's, there's things that I will write for myself. The, to draw, in the case of Ragmop, the only problem with that is that I know my shortcomings as an artist, and so I have to write to my own shortcomings if I'm doing it all myself. For example, I don't draw cars. I just, I don't draw cars. <laughs> I'm, I'm a storyboard artist as, as a living, and I was working on uh, Dog City, Jim Henson property, back in the 1990s. <laughs> and uh, I had a great time drawing Dog City, except you know, it, it takes place in the old gangster times when they're all driving around in cars. And so I would just draw a little square with a window, uh, and I would put the characters in the, in the window, and, and then I would just draw an outline, and I would put a note there on my storyboard saying, put car here. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I came to a part in Ragbop where I had six characters in a car, and I went, oh my god, why did you write that for yourself? Because you can't draw cars. And so I killed myself to draw this car. And then I had it going over a, a cliff. And I go, okay, I drew it so many different times. And finally, I just drew the underside of the chassis, which I could kind of do and cheat, not actually have to draw the car, because it's basically a rectangle with a couple circles on. So that's the problem I have with, you know, for writing, working with myself. Uh, but when it comes to collaborations, you know, I have a five graphic novel series that was never drawn by Charles Vess, which was supposed to be drawn by Charles Vess. You know, and so I, you know, that was a totally... Did you draw any of it? Did, did yes, he, yes he did. You, you can see some of the paintings in, his, in the Charles Vess art book there, a uh, property called Scade, um, uh, or the proper 
like uh, okay. proper ice lemons. We, we have to dig Available into this now. at a people. comic shop near you. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, dig into this now because now we're going to hear some dirt about Charles Vest. Yeah, so, so <laughs> really? didn't this get finished? Oh, uh, okay, first of all. Uh, and end it, your it, career now if you want. <laughs> Well, there's, a, there's my collaboration with Stephen T. Stephen T. Siegel as well, uh, which, which didn't come to fruition. But the Charles Vest property um, came about in approximately 1987, 1989. We sold it to uh, not to Glenot, but to a smaller French publishing. It was going to be a French graphic album. You know, how prestigious is that to produce a French graphic album? Uh, and they paid me two thousand bucks for the script back in 1989. So that was yeah. So that was good money. You could eat off that. I could. I could eat off that for a month. And uh, he eats but, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> a lot. Uh, you know, but, but this is one of these. This is just this is just one of these things where you know. Any, uh, a fr I, I I know a friend who has a, a good friend in Los Angeles. She's an A-list uh, producer. Um, and name. she and she says uh, her name is Zan, and um, uh, one of her movies was Easy A. Uh, and she's, she's an Oscar winning she's an Oscar winning producer. Now she says any movie that gets made is a miracle, and and if you get any movie made, you should just thank your lucky stars and go home and go. Oh my God, I can't believe we did it. And it's the same with comic books, and this is an example. So we sell we we, we have a signed contract to do a, a French graphic album. Uh, written by me, drawn, fully painted by Charles Best. The company, two months after later, the, the, what Charles is drawing it, the company is bought up by Glenot. Okay. Glenot immediately cancels all the contracts <coughs> that, this, that this other company had. You know, they, I guess they just wanted the properties that were already existing. Uh, and then over the next uh, 11 or 12 years, Charles and I uh, tried to sell the, tried to get it done, and, and Charles just couldn't get the work done. Basically, it comes down to the fact that Charles couldn't get. In in ballads and sagas, he adapted. In the first two issues of ballads and sagas, you'll see the first two installments of Skate in there in black oh, okay, and white. Okay, so at least some of it did come out. Okay, that's yeah. So some of it did come out, um, but basically, it, it didn't happen. I I, I sold it to uh, Top Shelf. Uh, we were going to do uh, do it as a prose. Uh, a prose story, which you is get paid on that too. Just keep shuffling it around. Yeah, <laughs> everyone take their turn. You just keep jacking. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. My father was a novelist, and one of his uh, his incomes came from selling options to his novels mm -hmm. and praying they didn't make films out of them. Yeah. Because every year you can turn that into a lovely annuity. The, the more films they don't make, the richer you get. Right, it's right. a lovely lesson about Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Skate was a, a project that never happened. And the other thing about collaboration is people always think of it in terms of negative terms. Like, oh my God. More well, everybody up here actually. Yeah, yeah but, but, but uh, so I'm very happy to hear that we all have positive things here. And I, and I approach it positively. I mean, Skate would have been a beautiful, beautiful work and a very happy collaboration had Charles been able to do the work. Speaking of happy <coughs> collaborations, uh, I'm curious, is there a specific collaborator that you guys have worked with that apparently does not work in the program you have to Yeah, oh, okay. That's that his now, there is a specific collaborator that you have worked with that you just go, oh, this is money in the bank, this is gold. This oh, I thought there. you were going to ask for a horror story. No, I'm going to ask for a horror story. And then I'm going to want to hear about the one that you beat up and left in the I don't know what you're talking about. I want to start uh, with the good one. Like that, I, that I've had? Or yeah, that, that you can just you, you slip into this collaboration like a lovely suit. That's a horrible bit of a <laughs> Um It sort of ties into actually some of the stuff that uh, Rob was saying because what, what happened, um, I did an uh, online graphic novel called The Makeshift Miracle, 2001 to 2003. Yeah. Thank you. And I drew that myself, and it was an exercise in learning how to do uh, my own comics. And uh, I would draw it three pages a week, regardless of whether I had time to do three pages a week, and sometimes it looked like it, and other times it looked really good. And But I learned a lot, and then part of it was about production, getting stuff done come hell or high water. And if I had a bad week, then I would sort of kick myself and go, I will not put up crap again. And so it was about moving forward more so than about every page must be perfect. That is arguably the greatest lesson in the making of any kind of art is just stop questioning yourself and do it. Well, there's a balance to be struck between self-critique and, and improving upon yeah. what you do, but but not paralyzing yourself with no. it, right? And so for me, that was what the exercise was. That's why I was doing it. So. On the 10th anniversary of Makeshift Miracle, I'm working with Udon, and we're redoing it. We're doing a much bigger story, a much broader scope, and we've got this Chinese watercolor artist 
who did these just unbelievable designs. Looked at my original book and said, oh, that's very nice. And then just did these sweeping, gorgeous, atmospheric, emotional. And so then I started writing bigger, grander. I started building some of the stuff that sort of like you were saying, I couldn't possibly do. I could then write. Well, sort of feeling a little guilty, like, well, I'm not going to be illustrating that. <laughs> Woo, buddy! Let's do a whole city now. Yeah, you know. name, I think you said Chinese watercolor artist, but you didn't say the name. Oh, sorry, his name is Shun Hong Chen. And okay. he's a just phenomenal, phenomenal artist. And so every time I give him one of these two page spreads that's just ludicrous and broad in scope, I curse myself a little because I'm like, I'm a, mad, I'm a bad person. Like, I, I would never have drawn this. I, I'm going to just put a little more in there, and I know he'll just knock it out of the park. And so it feels weirdly good, because it's my story, and I know it, but I'm getting this new vision of it. It's bigger and broader. Now, is this working off existing art from the original stuff? He's got the original book, but I'm also I'm rewriting it. I'd okay. like to think I'm a better writer than I was 10 years ago. And so I also have the hindsight of seeing the whole story. At the time, I was honestly developing a lot of it as I went. And so some of the stuff that probably could have been foreshadowed better or could have been, you know, the character development could have been clearer. Now I've got the, the foresight to know, okay, this is where it's all going and structure it out in a much more cohesive way. So. Now Richard, you've had the, uh, the tremendous, I hope a thrill, of getting to work with such guys as Dale Kewen has drawn some of your stories and I think Mike Mignola illustrated coverage for a script. Oh, we cover. We cover. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, who is your collaboration, uh, honey? Uh, it's got to be Dale. It's got to be Dale. It was, um, it's, you get this massive, unlimited, almost visual talent, and you get, draw that. So it's exactly that. Yeah. Draw that. And then you get back and you go, it becomes like a challenge. Yeah. It's just like, wow, I, I just want to see them do cool stuff. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, do you write me. to that? Do you make a point that I'm saying, you know, everybody in my story is going to be covered in shiny, shiny armor, because that's the way yeah. Dale likes to draw. No, actually, I pushed him. I pushed him in places, too, where he never would, would have gone on his own. So it was a bunch of dogs getting into cars, and he didn't want to draw that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that that's our collaboration. <laughs> if I win Rob, I will promise to teach him how to draw cars. <laughs> I've, I've heard this. I've heard this. And again, I'm going to lose my career with this one. I've heard that if you work with John Romita Jr., you should never write a helicopter scene, because oh, yeah. he just will not draw it. That's he has silhouettes. He, and, he's very happy with airplanes <clears throat> and motorcycles and anything else, but as soon as a helicopter and it, it turns into a stealth aircraft when he draws it. <laughs> Uh, so do you do you write to the artist? Because I like I write to the artist. Like if I, if yeah. I know who I'm, I way prefer to have that than, than writing sort of a script and throwing it out in the ether and well, sort of going. I gosh, wish I hope someone does a good yeah. job with this. Yeah. I way prefer it as well. Um, yeah. I'm not always afforded that luxury because every sure. now and then yeah. I will be writing a script because I tend to when I write is for stuff like uh, the animated Batman and Super and right. Spider-Man books stuff like that. Yeah, but that's got a set style too. So yes, but <laughs> but a set style does not mean you're going to have the same artist every oh, that's time. True. And so there are a number of times over the years where I have written the script and literally not known who was going to do it and sometimes you get something fantastic and sure. sometimes yeah. you get something that's not so much and I won't name those names because that, that's, yeah, that's, that's just sad. Career and careers. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, we've already ended their careers. So hey, yeah. And uh, um, to me the joy would be uh, sometimes getting the art back and going, oh that artist drew me this month. That's really fun. Because yeah. I, I got uh, drawn a lot by uh, Scott Hampton. Uh, Scott and Bohampton, and I did not know sending the scripts out was going to come back that these guys were going to do it, because you wouldn't expect them to do a Batman animated style. And they did a fantastic job. If you guys aren't aware of them, they're really delicate watercolor painters, these guys, and they work on some of the animated books. And to me, that was the biggest thrill. I will say this about, about me as a collaborator versus someone who else uh, I, I work with with other artists. Whenever I know I am going to draw the story, I am a much more um, unpleasant writer is that I know that scripts look great with crowd scenes in them, and I write crowd scenes all the time, knowing I'm going to draw them later. And then when it comes time to draw them, I actually will curse myself, like, what idiot wrote this crowd scene? Because crowd scenes, you guys know, the hardest things to do. And I think I write a crowd scene in every script I write that I know I'm drawing. Oh, wow. Because I wouldn't do that to another artist, but I will do it to me. Yeah, well, that's the understanding. The, the one thing about collaboration is you have to understand that this is a partnership. And if you're going to collaborate with someone, you really have to understand what their strengths and weaknesses are yeah. and, and write to them. And it's not that you, you, you don't want to, um, you want to get the best out of them. And, and so you, you do the things that they love. And if you do that, uh, 
and it's not difficult, uh, regardless of what the, the, the subject or genre. Yeah, the end is. results can be way better. Yeah, yeah the, the, the end results are, 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 are amazing. Has anyone here worked in what is famously called in our business Marvel style scripting? Oh yes, I have. Okay, well I that's have. a very for those who don't know, Marvel style style scripting is when the writer doesn't really do much. Uh, <laughs> I've done it. You said it. Huh? I'm trying to end the career. Uh, and, and basically, what it is is the the writer uh, calls the artist up and says, "What's weird though is it's it's called Marvel style." Just it's really that's Stanley, what Stanley Lee wrote. Yeah. But and most of the guys at Marvel now write full script. Uh, not everybody. No, not everyone, but no. most do. And, no, and, and the basic point. premise is that you call up the artist and go, "This is going to start Doctor Doom, and there'll be some helicopters on page eight, and uh, <laughs> dogs in a car, and somewhere around page ten there'll be an explosion, and I'll write it when you're done." And that way the artist goes off and they actually plot and pace the story most of yeah. themselves. But that's, that's a lot more information than they actually got. Usually just <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about when I do it that way. Oh, you, usually with Stan, did it, you'd be walking by the door and you'd see John Romita sitting there and go, Oh, Rhino next month. And he'd walk on. <laughs> and John Romita go, Oh, crap. <laughs> to be fair, I believe, I, I believe Romita would look up and say, I'm doing Rhino next month. And Stan would go, Thank you. And that would be right. <laughs> right. Uh, so talk about Marvel, Marvel style collaboration. It's a very different style. Of okay, I'll, I'll tell you because I've got the microphone here. Right. In, the, in the back of Ragmoth, there's a short story. Um, and it's, it's a story of me walking through my neighborhood thinking profound thoughts. Now, how we did that is, I, is, is Rick Taylor uh, drew that. And um, so what he did is he photographed me walking, actually walking through my neighborhood. And then he sent me about three dozen photographs. And I took the photographs and I laid them out all on the floor and I started to choose photographs that actually told the story sequentially. And I got to get, once I, once I settled on five pages of, or however long the story is, four, four or five pages of, of worth of, of photographs that worked in a sequential sequence, I sent them back to him, he drew it, sent the pages back to me, and then I scripted it blind. Uh, so wait, there were photos of you thinking important thoughts, but yes. you were literally not thinking. <laughs> no, 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 it was me. I was walking around pondering. No, I get that you were looking yes. like you were pondering. Yes. But you actually had no pondering in your mind. When these no, 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 I, I left that totally till, till when I, it was when I got acting. the artwork back. <laughs> yes, it was acting. I love that. And it was a wonderful, it was one of the most, it, uh, why I like working that way is because it, it, it just uses so much imagination. And it, it, you just, your brain is just cooking. Uh, that, that sounds way. like a very specific kind of a script because there wasn't a lot of choreographed action in that. You weren't trying to figure out how to break into the vault. No, in that I didn't. Story. No, just luckily I didn't. Figure out how to walk from that. one end of the street to the other end of the street. Uh, yeah, but it was a little bit more. I think the. I think Jim's the, the, Yeah, I think the one <laughs> advantage, admittedly, of the vault. So I write full scripts, and every so often I'll realize that I've. Now that we have the art, we're trying to cram the dialogue in because the dialogue was really important. But now the artist hasn't left enough room, or it doesn't actually work, and then we end up revising a bunch of dialogue. With Marvel method, where basically or Stan's method, where the artist draws all the pages, and then the writer comes back and dialogues it, scripts it. They're not going to overwrite the words. You're going to go, well, this is how much word room I've got. Well, they're going to say three words because you cram the head up to the top of the panel or whatever. So I mean, it, it would be fascinating because I you'd hear stories about artists who. Had, just drawn something, and then you know when Stan comes and scripts it or whoever scripted it, it would just be a completely different interaction than what they were expecting. I, I've had that experience. I was working on a Marvel Avengers series a number of years back, and my artist, as I'm Derek Oakley, uh, he drew a sequence that was supposed to be Doctor Doom entering a room and threatening a bunch of people. And it was only supposed to take about five panels of one page, and he stretched it over three. Amazing. And when it came, including a big, a, a big uh, full panel shot of Doctor Doom just standing there. That was and, funny. Hmm? That was money. Yeah. And, no, because we could resell the pages later. And I, I, had that, I had that terrible problem because I already knew the dialogue he had to say was only going to take about five panels. So now we got to add all sorts of other so stuff. So it's like, and Mary. furthermore, I was also is changing my butt. Yeah. And, and he just said it very, very slowly. Yeah. Nice. And, and the funny thing was, Dude. in general, it takes me about three to four days to get a script ready. It took me two to three days to write that three-page sequence uh. because I, I stared at it going, that's not what I want. And I, I fought against it for so long until eventually he just starts telling jokes. Let me tell you, two lap is going to work. And, and it, it eventually solved my problem. But for the longest time, that was the most difficult thing I've ever had to write was a scene that I didn't expect to be there. Oh, really? So it was the last time I've ever written Marvel so. There's a really infamous story about uh, Mc... Sorry, go ahead, go ahead, can you think? I learned utter contempt for the Marvel style of my first job for Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> I worked on this a portion of a book called Terror Incorporated. Oh. Yeah. Come here, yeah. 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 
was written by a former editor. Who was your editor? Uh, uh, Mark McLarsley, the editor. Mark McLarsley. Great guy. Did a terrible uh, Remember that. <laughs> a lot of bad books. This is the 90s, man. Right? Uh, and it was written by a former editor named D.G. Chichester. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I suddenly learned um, uh, exactly how little work and thought can be put into a story that will expand up to 22 pages. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I later compared it to when you hire a penciler to do layouts for another artist. They don't really do layouts. They kind of hack off, you know, this is the storytelling, go finish it. Uh, when, when a writer is doing a plot, they're not thinking anything through. They're not thinking about what the characters are doing. They're not thinking about what the motivations are. They're not even thinking about how the action sequences really play out. There's like, oh, here's a bunch of shit, right? All right, and they really can't complain whatever they get back because there's so much latitude in the plot. And my first plot, I, 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 I didn't know anything about this character. I knew the book was drawn by Jorge Zafino, who was amazing, but he gave up trying halfway through his run in the book. And look at it, you've got an undead green character with three spikes on either side of his head. So I had all these That's questions. That's special power. That was his power. <laughs> He could poke people in the eye like this. <laughs> and, and I, so I get this job, and I ask my editor, I said, okay, okay, so what's his origin? Why are these spikes? Where did he get this power to, like, leech memories off of dead body parts? Editor didn't know. So I said, well, who created it? Well, your writer created it. I said, oh, I thought he was from Epic. Yeah, he was the editor, and he co-created the character. So I asked the writer. Oh. <laughs> Was that essential in telling that issue's story, though? I mean, how do you approach it if you... It was if, never essential to the character. No, but when you, when you have a loose plot, yeah. how do you as a creator then say, I have to now step up and put on my pacing and plotting hat? How do you do that? What's the process you go through? Well, my initial process was being terrified that, well, how the hell am I supposed to turn this into a story? Okay, but after you change your underwear, yeah. then what do you do? Well, <laughs> what do you mean change my underwear? <laughs> Uh, no, uh, uh, basically, I started asking questions about, like, you know, well, he's back at his base. What's his base look like? Oh, I'll design some kind of base thing. <laughs> right? So, I, so I, I, I come up with a laundry list. Okay, this guy's immortal. He's been around who knows how long. He gets memories from people that he takes the body parts from. Can he have, like, a big refrigeration unit so he can keep parts of his old friends? So he can actually experience his friends that died centuries ago? He goes, wow. That's the writer on the book. <laughs> He created this character. <laughs> to, be, to be fair, to be fair, this was the 90s. Yes, to be fair. That's they let anybody in. This sounds like a nanny. There's, there's a pretty infamous, there's a pretty infamous, right, it's bad on like someone else's dirt. But, but Todd McFarlane, and he's talked to it, bragged about this in interviews, so it's not like I'm saying something that he would want hidden or whatever. He bragged about his writing process on, on Spider-Man when he took over the adject of this Spider-Man, and he would literally just do full-page shots and double-page spreads that he knew he could sell for unholy amounts of money, and he knew who the villain was, so he'd throw them in a bunch of it, and then he would just put them on the floor, and he'd figure out how many bridging pages he needed to make all those things happen. Yeah, I've read it. <laughs> and that was literally how the issues were being written. And then when you read the, if you know that, you reread those issues, you're like, oh, oh, okay, that's why that guy... Yeah, that totally makes sense. <laughs> years, years ago, I was on a panel with Todd McFarlane, and the question that was asked by the audience was, what's the most difficult part of your working day? And his answer was, keeping my swipe file organized. And he said that in public, and I just went, you know there's people out there. And he didn't seem to think this was a problem to admit this. That is, a, you know, sometimes when I'm looking for that, you know, Walt Simonson swipe, and it's stuck in with all my other swipes, I can't find it. So honestly, said this is from a panel full of people. Okay, since we're, we're doing Todd McFarlane. Yes. <laughs> Suddenly it's less a brag on Todd McFarlane. Before we do, buy and sell us 400 be, times Before over. we do, I love Tommy so Farrell. I love him as a human being. I love his artwork. He's a good person. Now let's attack him. <laughs> Okay, my Todd McFarlane as a writer's story is I'm sitting at a table with him uh, over lunch, this is years ago, and um, and I've got Daniel Close beside me, and, and uh, he's just he's just doing everything to keep a straight face. Uh, <laughs> did he not like Todd's work? Um, no, but I did a, um, a Dan Poussey drawing of, uh, in, in Todd McFarlane's Spider-Man style for, for, okay. for Daniel, which he, he greatly appreciated. But anyhow, uh, so so the, the question comes up, you know, Todd, uh, you know, what's the, what's the thing about writing that, that you've learned about? You know, what's the most important thing you've learned about writing? He says, he says, 
Well, I guess the most important thing about writing is never use the same word in the same sentence twice. Oh wait, I, I used the word sentence. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, he uh, psyched himself out there. <laughs> um, okay, uh, my next question, because I have a great time, you're probably sure that I actually would get my career over, so I'm going to tell that one. Uh, but uh, I want to ask, this question is, uh, when did you know that you were going to do this for a living? That you at some point went, this is not just me goofing around, trying to find someone to get a story to go in with This is a living. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I don't when did know you know, if you know when it's did you know that you're going to be dragged down into this heroin addiction <laughs> hell? <laughs> well, I get to go first? Yeah. yeah. yeah why not? Um, I was reading my uh, Valentine edition of Frank Frazetta art books, and said he did comics before he could do Conan. So I went, oh, fuck, I'm doing that. So wait, you, uh, you knew before you started doing it that this was what you were going to do? I always knew I liked to draw. He put the chains on himself. Yeah, I, I, wow. I figured I'd be out of this by now. I, I actually like went out and I came back. I'm really yeah, fucked yeah. up. It's, man, it's like, it is terrible. It's crack. Terrible. Crack. 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 <laughs> Did, did, you, did you find there was a day when you, when you said that I really have to make this conscious decision, I have to stop pretending I'm going to be a sheet metal worker, I am actually going to do that? Pretending sheet making sheet metal is Pretending that you someday I'm going to be the best sheet metal maker that ever was. <laughs> story about that. When I was in high school, we had uh, we had metalworking class, and whenever the teacher would go to the washroom, we'd all just make ninja stars. <laughs> Roll up the metal, make the ninja stars. Throw them at the Baltimore. Oh, he's coming, he's coming. Anyways. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, working at the Udon Studio, I've had a lot of opportunities to work in. We've done work for animation, we've done work for video games, we've done work for movie stuff. Let's take a two-second back there, because you sure. said working at the Udon Studio is as though yeah. that's something you can walk in off the street and go, hey, Udon! Hire me. How does that happen? Mr. Udon, where are you? No, um, my uh, dirty, dirty contacts, terrible connections. Uh, networking is, is obviously a huge part of this. you got to be able to do the work, but obviously if you have a choice between someone you know who can do the work and someone you don't know who can do the work, you're probably going to choose someone that you know who you can get along with. I uh, went to school with uh, an artist named uh, Omar Dogen. We um, were in the same year at uh, Animation at, uh, at Sheridan. And we both left after second year to go work uh, at a studio out in Calgary. Uh, we didn't know a lot of other people at the studio, so we got an apartment together, and it was worse than being married, and I mean this in the nicest way. We wake up, drive with his car, go to work, our desks were beside each other at the studio, <laughs> we draw, then we go grab lunch, because we didn't really talk with the other people, and then we work, and then we drive home, and then one of us would make dinner, and then we play video games, and then we go to sleep, and then we wake up, and then we go to work, and this is endless droning madness. I wasn't in bed. It's okay. So, uh, so, so what ends up happening is that we became, you know, uh, really good friends, and he ended up leaving the studio. I stuck around a little bit longer. Um, but he would end up going to work at Dreamwave eventually, and then uh, after Dreamwave, he went and worked uh, when the Udon Studio formed. He joined up with them, so he'd been there for a few years. I finally came back to Toronto, and he called me up almost immediately and said, "Well, you took a long way home, but you made it. You know, welcome back to Toronto. Uh, what are you doing?" And I was just like, "I have no idea what I'm going to do with myself. Um, I'm kind of screwed." Um, and so. He basically invited me up to the studio, got to meet a lot of the guys, I showed my work, and they said, well, your stuff looks fine, we just don't have any openings. There's no projects, we've got enough people to cover the work. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, but if you want to just hang out, you know, hang out. So I learned some stuff about Photoshop I didn't know, and kind of hung out with people, and then a week later, they called me up and said, we now have more work. <laughs> yeah, no, we just got a new big project. So your, your, your period of paying the dues was five days. <laughs> yeah, five days. <laughs> So then I was like, um, they asked me if I would just do some coloring, some comic book coloring. Uh, they were recoloring um, Barry Windsor Smith stuff for the Conan Chronicles when, when Dark Horse got the license. So they said they just need this stuff fast and they rendered this way and we do it. So I cranked out as much as I could. I was like, my summer job is coloring comics. And then I was planning to go back to school in September. But by the time the summer wrapped up, I mean, I knew I didn't want to do anything else. I was really, really enjoying it. I was going to go back to school to retrain uh, to, to learn 3D animation because a bunch of my friends were getting into video games, and I was like, well, I don't want to do computer animation, but that's where the money is, so I'll do it if I have to. And then by the end of the summer, we had tons of work, and I said, well, I'll put that off as long as humanly possible. 
And so, that summer so job is now on my putting off the money. Yeah, my summer job is my eleventh year with this summer job. So wow. it's been all right. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Rob, what what was the moment when you went, Oh god damn it, this is my job now, isn't it? Uh yeah, probably around when I was three. Um, <laughs> I, I you know what? I, I, I was born an artist. You know, no sane person would choose this life. This life chooses you. You know, it's it's basically that's the way my brain is wired. You know, I cannot not do this if I'm not creating. And this is why I don't. You know, I, I got a file full of stuff that you'll never see um, because I have to keep doing it. If I don't do it, I will wither and I will die. It doesn't matter. You know, I've been fortunate that I've been working in animation for 20 years to support myself, more or less. Um, uh, but uh, it was just something I just always, always did. My father said that uh, my father was an author. I was just wondering once. He uh, he was always asked why he became a writer, and he said the only real question is why can't I stop? Yeah. Because if you have to do it, you do it, and it doesn't matter if anybody wants you to. If you're fortunate, somebody pays you. But at a certain level, yeah. I, I, I do this every Saturday morning on a thing called Buntu, and nobody pays me for this. And every time I do this every Saturday morning, a part of my brain goes, "What am I doing? No yeah. one's paying me." Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't mean to hit the mic. I'm up a quarter now for three years on this. <laughs> um, and, 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 it be, and it becomes that situation of why am I waking up early on a Saturday morning to do this? Because I have to. That's I right. can't stop myself. It's a terrible thing. Yeah, I was unemployed for 11 months last year. And uh, when you fall through the cracks in animation, it, it's. it's <laughs> You know, it, 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 thank you. It, it, it's, the, it's the worst experience. And you, see, you lose your humility. Yeah, yeah, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, my family was paying my rent for six months, and um, you know, it's it's, it's an awful. It, it's a great industry. It's an awful industry in, in that way. The art. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I wrote a novel. Myself saying I wrote a novel. And as we all do. That's as we all do when we're unemployed. Um, as long as the novel isn't about like an angry out of work artist. No, it's not about an angry, angry out of work artist. But Although I do have a great story idea for a, a writer who goes mad because he can't get his ideas out. So yeah. that being said, you know, so I, I have a I have a career that never was. Um, I was actually an original Marvel tryout finalist. Um, does anybody guys, does anybody remember the Marvel tryout book? Oh yeah. yeah. So was it, were you, was it, it, like, it was me. There was me and 29 other people in the world. So were you in a death spiral with Mark Bagley? Like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll let you see he one. Won the Marvel tryout. Oh, he won. That was yeah, his first so gig. Was oh, the Marvel tryout. Oh really? I was, I was, I was, uh, I won for writing and for inking of all things. Nice. Um, but uh, Marvel style of writing. Whoa. So, there you, you know. go. Hack. But. Uh, <laughs> I read your script. Bar. I think yeah. it was guy walks down the street, thinks thoughts. Profoundly. <laughs> 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 uh, let, let me uh, let me ask this question. Um, uh, as you guys find the people that you admire, you look in the world and say, "Oh, I really enjoy that person's work." Do you find that you admire the work of people? You don't admire anyone. You're like, take the mic. No, no. Okay, right. I, I admire somebody. Richard's giving me a quarter. He's good people. Uh, when you when you when you look at the work of other people, do you find yourself excited by the folks who do it all themselves, such as a Frank Miller back when he could still do it, and uh, or or somebody like you know the collaborations of Lee Kirby or Lee Ditko and that kind of thing. What? And by the way, I'm just showing off how old I am. <laughs> What do you find gooses you the most? Do you, do you, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Canada, it's the national bird. All right. Um, I, I mean, for me, I, I have so much more appreciation for how much art it is and how much is involved in it. So I, I, look, at, I look at so many different books, especially creator-owned books, because, you know, if someone's doing um, commercial work or big two work that, that is their primary income, you know, it's awesome. And some of that work is jaw-dropping and stunning and amazing and every other Marvel adjective uncanny and incredible. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but the reality, though, is that if someone's doing creator around, generally speaking, they're not making good money on it. If they can put that out on a regular basis, if they can put it out in a, in a similar quality range, that, there's a level of dedication and sacrifice involved with that that I, I know what that feels like and I know what that... So when I see someone at a show and they're putting this stuff out and it looks good and it's consistent and it's on pure effort because there's no guarantee of a paycheck, very little, uh, that really drives me. That, that reminds me about why I do what I do and, and all that kind of stuff. 
it, but but do you find because at, at that point that was a very general answer. Do you find sure. do I look at this creator or this creative team as the one that gets me excited? Solo creators are the ones that always get me excited because on a certain oh, level, there's a, a, yeah incredible you know uh, respect when you see that someone can literally run with the ball in every single avenue. You know they're lettering it, they're doing all that stuff, and it, yeah. it blows your mind that they, their craft is that refined in every area. Like, I would, I, I would Jeff say Smith, a, exactly. Like, I was going to say the last uh, twenty five years, I think yeah. Jeff Smith is the person that blew yeah. it back in my well, head. Well, and it, it, I think it, it blew my mind too. And the great thing about Bone was that, first of all, because I come from an animation background, it had that animated quality to it. That the story time felt very much like storyboards, but the best kind, you know. Uh, work had incredible appeal, it's an emotional, it's personal, but it's very inviting. Like everything about it is running at full steam. And when you see that working, yeah, it does, it, it blows your mind. And grandma raised cows. Yeah. But there was a, the great thing is, I think with comics you can be an individual or you can be a very small, tight-knit team. Even the smallest of films, even the smallest of productions, you know, yes, there are people who do their own animation, but they will literally spend an entire year to get out, you know, a few minutes. When I was working on The Simpsons, I wrote through The Simpsons comic book often on a number of years, and, and a number of people while I was doing this would read one of my issues and say, do you ever want to work on the show? And my answer would always be, hell no. Because if I work on the show, I'd be lucky if uh, 50 to 30% of the script made it to air. You'd have to throw it through a room full of 26 other people. Most of them right. are hysterically funny people and who will trot all over your good work. Sure. And then it has to be handed to a director and 17 animators and a bunch of people that you'll ever meet. And when I would write and draw an issue of The Simpsons, it would go from the blank page to the yeah. finished. The only thing I didn't do was the uh, coloring on it. And it, would, and it would go out the door, and it was like I could make my own little private episodes of The Simpsons, which would be distributed to the world. And, and to me, that was amongst the most fun stuff I've ever done in my life, was getting to make little Simpsons episodes in my basement. And so I, I'm happy in those circumstances I didn't collaborate with someone else because I am enough of a control freak that I wanted to be able to write Homer's dialogue and then draw Homer falling in the vat of beer exactly how I expected it. <laughs> um, I, I got a weird habit. I take inspiration from everywhere. Uh, I, I'm not really um, discerning in terms of what I'll look at. I'm at the point now where I'll, I'll, I'll grab the world's worst art book and still look through it to see if there's that one tip I didn't know before. So I will not to do. Yeah. Well, often that. There's a, there's but, a great... Uh, but, um, for example, it's like, I'll read everything Alan Moore does, and I'll look at the synthesis of what he does as a writer, what the artist does in response to what he's doing as a writer, to learn something. But there is there is one book that's kind of like a touchdown for me to look at, see what someone can actually do. And it's this book called Mother Come Home. And it's this heart-wrenching book that almost no one's ever heard of. Dark Who's uh, Paul Unpronounceable Last Name. <laughs> okay. Joe, do you have Mother Come Home? Does anybody up? know how to pronounce his last name? <laughs> Horschmeyer or something like that? Horschmeyer, oh, yeah, Horschmeyer. Close enough. Okay. See? Yeah. So and, you guys all know. It, 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 it is, it is an yeah, absolute... It's, 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 it's very <laughs> depressing. So. I know, but it's absolutely it's brilliant comics. It's not to read over and it, over, it, over again. Well, I have. It's not a <laughs> But it, the Scarship. No, um... But it is, it is, it's an all-in-one, it's a one-man band, and it is absolutely brilliant. It's all of one mind work. I don't know how long it took him to do it, but I look at it, and it's a thing of beauty, and it's incredibly deeply personal. It is better than 90% of the shit we're talking about. And it's really underappreciated. I realize someone out there can do something like that, be that good at it, it doesn't matter if it has an audience of more than just me. Probably matters to him, so we should well, have a few, a few <laughs> yeah. copies tonight. Yeah. yeah, and I don't get a percentage, so go ahead and get one. <laughs> Rob, do you find this? You, you know the guy's name? You have <laughs> I, I do. I just collaborators <laughs> and teams or people who just go out there and crunch it themselves? Uh, well, I'm, I'm probably equal 50 50. Uh, for collaboration, let me just say Scalped. Um, best comic of I don't know when. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Jason Aaron and um, Guerra. Okay. Um, not Red Skull. I'm apparently not reading Skull. <laughs> <laughs> we can change that. Let's, okay, okay. I give up on it. I'm sorry. Okay, no, Richard, Richard, Richard didn't like it. I think it was the best thing. Uh, I thought a great 18 issues. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, anyways, I, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's the best drawn comic uh, yeah, that I. Uh, you know, the, 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 there's an the expression. Um, uh, you, an artist is a great actor, and, and that's what you want. You don't want just want, you, for comics. You don't want someone who can just 
draw. You want someone who can act as well. But getting away, so that's a, that's that's a perfect marriage. Um, Prometheus is probably uh, Promethea is probably another perfect marriage between Alan yeah, Moore yeah. and William the um, uh, Third. But then there's but then there's Pogo. Um, there's Chuck Jones and Michael Maltese. Uh, you know. The, in terms of animation, uh, that combination of director and writer. Uh, so, there, I mean, there's, there's examples of, um, so we talk about um, uh, Walt Kelly, uh, you talk about um, Charles Schultz in comic books, uh, Kirby and Lee, uh, certainly the Fantastic Four. Um, and, then, and then I love Kirby's 70s run where he's doing it all himself. I mean, that he's was. He's not doing it entirely himself, Mark of the Year, still doing a lot of the dialogue. Yeah, well, they're, they're, well yeah. Okay. I'm credited, but it was. So. Okay, that, that, that's fine. <laughs> Um, but certainly Kirby and Royer as an inking, you know, in terms of a, 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 that kind of a, a team, or Kirby and Sinnott. Um, I, I find, for instance, that I have to confess my favorite comic of the last ten years was a collaboration, and it was a meat and potatoes comic book called Captain America by Ed Brubaker and yeah. Butch, Butch Geis. You may and, have heard uh, of uh, Captain America. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Butch, Butch Geis, and I, I'm leaving out the last one, um, uh, Steve Epic. And I, I genuinely feel that everything that the three of those guys did on that book, none of them would have been that good on their own. And I think that they all really did pay off each other. So in the long run, I, I do have to admit that I really do love collaboration. But I seek out and I admire the solo guys more because I think on a certain level the glory of comics is that we can do it all by ourselves. You can't make a film that way. You can't even make a novel that way, even though you think you do, because you've got 75 editors on top of you and a, and a marketing department and all that other stuff. Although that's changing with the digital yeah. market. But, but right now, comics seem to be this place where a single creator can just go oof and make it all themselves, and I think I admire them that the most. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to... People can do that? Yeah. <laughs> I make that noise all the time when I draw. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to make sure that there's nobody out there who wants to have a chance to ask one of our three wonderful creators a question. I'd like you to have a chance to, if you could, uh, before we leave. So someone throw a hand up and we'll ask them an embarrassing question. Otherwise, I'll tell my toddler for home. No, you won't. <laughs> uh, she knows it, so she knows damn well I better not tell her. Go ahead. You can. Uh, and either do you um, sort of recount an experience where you were working with someone that you felt just didn't understand what you were trying to do and how you... <laughs> <laughs> He's been waiting all night yeah, apparently for that. I'm not going to say names in this one. You already said it was Dan Chichester. <laughs> And this is someone I actually respect. <laughs> okay. um, I, I had a friend who wanted to draw a certain project for a long time, harass me constantly, right? So, was this me? No. <laughs> <laughs> right. I had a friend. <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> okay. It wasn't you, okay. but he had a two-letter first name. <laughs> um, uh, and he really wanted to draw this project. So I got him the gig, or her. <laughs> And I wrote the script exactly to what him or her likes to draw. <laughs> and then he or she fucked off and did an absolute piece of garbage job. It was like soul crushingly bad. And it's like, how do you. you Is there a sound effect for that too? <laughs> <laughs> Very similar. Yeah. But nothing good comes out at the end of it. <laughs> It was, it was bad. A a anyone else have a story that they, that they, they care to make that noise about? I can provide the noise. You guys, the yeah, there you go. Um, I think, you know, this is the thing is that when you get into commercial work, tell me, not telling you this, when you get into commercial work, uh, you have to make compromises. You have to realize you're working for a client, you're working for an editor, an art director, a company, uh, and their decision making processes very different from your own personal creative decision making process. And so finding the balance between being passionate about it and enthusiastic about it, but not so attached that you can't handle the changes that, that it's not yours, that you don't own it. You know what I mean? That this is not your decision. And at the end of the day, you know, they can do what they want and they will make those decisions regardless. That's a hard thing to, to find the balance between. And so, but for me, having Skull Kickers, having my own creator own book, is like my safe haven. No matter what other stuff happens, no matter what industry stuff happens, no matter what sort of uh, curveballs I get dealt in terms of industry stuff or projects or you name it, I've got this thing that's mine and it's going to be done the way I want. And Edwin and I are rocking this thing out. And when it's all done, I know who to blame for it. You know what I mean? So that I don't. 
Is it yeah. Todd McFarlane? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I can blame Todd McFarlane. Uh, I, w I won't say the name, but uh, years ago when I was working on a major character, one of the companies, that's as far as I'm going to go, uh, my editor calls What's me his up. theme song? Yeah. <laughs> it's got swinging in it. And uh, my, editor, my editor called me up and he said, uh, don't get shocked, but this issue we let the letterer draw it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And I said, why? And he goes, well, he's been lettering the book at this point for two years, and your scripts are kind of artist-proof, so, you know, it'll work. Let what him do it. What could go wrong? What could go wrong? And he's been dying to break into penciling for years and years, so they let him uh, pencil an issue. It's the only issue of comics he has ever drawn in his life. <laughs> I don't think there is a such thing as artist proof. I keep hearing this mythical script. Well, my wife will tell you this. I never, once I saw the pages come in, I refused to read it. I would not actually oh. read my script because I was so upset by what the art looked. It was terrible. And about uh, two or three weeks ago, I pulled it out and I read this issue, which is at this point 10, 12 years old. And I came to her and I said, you know, it's not that bad. <laughs> you know, but it took me oh, 12 years, years to get off the page. for me to stop <laughs> hating it. Uh, are there any other questions we have tonight? Do you know, I, I, I funny comment about that. You were mentioning about, uh, I used to look at a lot of artwork. I would look at artists, I would look at comics, and I would notice that sometimes it was good, sometimes it was bad. Even an artist I really liked, sometimes I was just like, man, this is crap. They, wait, they were really good, and now they're doing crap. Man, I will never do crap. I will never work on crap. You know, you get that art student idealism, and you just, I'm going to be perfect in every way. And now when I see crap like that, I open it up and I go, Oh man, that project must have sucked. Yeah. <laughs> or that deadline must have sucked. Or that whole working experience must have sucked. And I can feel it coming through the page. I always, I'm always aware of how much effort somebody put into it. For years, I would send comics for free. Everyone, uh, DC and Marvel would send me the complete collection yeah. for free. And, and at a certain point, they start to fill up the house because you give me two or three hundred comic books every couple of weeks. And I couldn't bring myself to throw them away. I had to find someone I could give them to who would appreciate them because. On a certain level, if I sell them to a store, I'm kind of cheating. It's a gift, and that's a sort of jerky thing to do. And if I just put them in a box somewhere and never read them, that's sort of wasting them. So I would have to find people who would want them because I know the effort that went into making that issue of Teen Titans or that issue of, of Green Lantern or whatever it was, and I couldn't just simply put it away and not have someone read it because of that awareness of the time it took to do it. I give away comics at Halloween in my house. That's how I yeah, do it. Yeah, I've done that too. Yeah, or the kids go bonkers. At one point, I gave I gave a pile of comics. <laughs> at one point, I gave a pile of comics to a hospital up the street from where we were living, and uh, they refused them. <laughs> I give them away at conventions. If you're ever at a convention and I'm there and I've got rag mob, wait till the last day because I give them away to free. I think they say give away other people's comics. <laughs> I was down in New York. Did you York. the Avengers? I was down in New York. just gave me all these Batman Avengers books here. <laughs> Basically, Ragbox too heavy to carry home. So, I, I was down in New York and I, I started this experiment. And uh, I put up a sign on my desk saying, they, they, they say I can't give this book away. I say I can. <laughs> Free copies. And there's a guy here sitting with a Todd McFarlane Spider-Man shirt, you know. <laughs> I love Tom McFarland. It gets better. I defend Tom McFarland to the death. I adore Tom McFarland. Actually, I think it's a lot of Tom McFarland stories. This is true. Are you, are you trying to wrap this up? Uh, I, 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 I might be. Uh, uh, my wife's wrapping it up for five minutes. All right, Actually, I, had, I had one thought. Okay. Um, but Only but one. one. <laughs> it's the same It's one, one at a time. It's his power. All work and no play. Jack and the whole boy. Um, when we're talking about, uh, like you were saying that you have to, and your dad was saying, no, I one thing to start writing, so I think to stop. Uh, years and years and years ago, Harlan, Harlan Nelson came up to a comic convention in Toronto, ended up eating lunch next to him. Okay, and Harlan Nelson being Harlan Nelson, he decided to talk to me because he saw me drawing, and he was being really sort of, And I, I was like, oh, he was being sarcastic. <laughs> so, Harlan Ellison. I know. Anyway, so I said, I said, you know, you got a real bad reputation for being really, really hard on writers. And I, I think I know why, right? He's wearing like these, these shades and they're really, really dark in, inside this convention center, right? And he just like, his face kind of like, tell me, right? And I said, because if the person's really going to write, he's going to write no matter what the fuck you say. You can tell him he should never, ever, ever go near a typewriter. And if the guy really has to write, he's going to go get one anyway, right? Yeah, you're fucking right. Shut up. <laughs> I wonder, though, <laughs> out loud, if you have somebody of the stature of, uh, of uh, 
about my heart when all of a sudden it tells you your shit go away, if it actually would land on you. I was in uh, I was at a convention in uh, uh, Paris a couple of years ago with uh, Neil Adams, and there was a fellow that came up uh, with his portfolio of work, and he put it down in front of Neil. And I don't know if you've ever, if anybody ever here watched Neil review people's portfolios, he can be really harsh. Yeah. And and as he was flipping through the the book, after about the sixth or seventh page, he finally decides to speak to this guy and he goes, have you ever considered dentistry? <laughs> <laughs> or any other career, or anything but this. And the guy, he's like 19, and the guy just sort of shuts the book and then just starts to shuffle out of the, out of the comic store that we were in. And at the time I was sitting uh, uh, with Bernie Wrightson and Bernie and I just jumped up out of our chairs and ran out of the building and caught this guy. He's going down the street and go, Neil's an asshole. You're not that bad. <laughs> you have to understand that Neil says this to everybody. Neil tells Mike Mignola he can't draw. He does this to everyone. <laughs> so you have to be okay with the fact that it's just kind of cool that he looks at your artwork. Don't take this to heart. And I'm, I, I don't know if we necessarily saved him from jumping into the river, but <laughs> he was really disheartened by having someone with a stature of Neil Adams more or less say to him, you have no chance, go away. And I wonder if the, you know, that could destroy people in a way that you know, having your brother say you suck with. Mm -hmm. um, no, there was a guy in Montreal, remember when Neil was there, not this year, last year, and he was doing portfolio reviews, and I overheard some guy who was laughing himself silly, he's like, oh, you should have heard what Neil said about this, no, he hated this, mm -hmm. and his friend's like, aren't you upset? He went, Neil Adams. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I really think it comes down to, it's like, uh, if, if there's really no honey spirit over because I used to get really nice portfolio reviews, and that is the most useless thing you can do for anyone. But just be nice to them? Being nice enough? No, talk to uh, after, after like, after like <laughs> 10, I mean, yeah, be nice. <laughs> if you got, got somebody like 16, like 24, showing you samples with that hopeful glint in their eye, and you say, oh, this is good, keep going, okay, you're not doing anyone any good. I mean, I, I actually got a rep for giving really harsh reviews. Yeah, but, but harsh but useful is useful. I mean, if you say no, you're terrible... I have, told, I have told people they'll never work in professional comics. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I said, you, you bastard. I said, why are you drawing Hulk pages? Do you really want to draw the Hulk? I just really want to do comics. I said, would you like to draw the adventures of a plumber? He goes, ah, that's funny, I'm a plumber. I said, would you like to tell your life story in comics? He goes, that's actually what I want to do. So why the fuck are you trying to get Marvel work? Right, he went, oh. Right, and this is just a few years ago. I said, publish them on the internet. You can do comics. You don't have to get Marvel to pay you to do it. Well, that's the great thing about about the web. If, if you know the guy that made XKCD went to a publisher and said, "I'm going to draw stick figures making math and philosophy jokes," they never would have picked it up. Now it gets <laughs> Axcom. Uh, Axcom. Axcom. Exactly. It's a perfect example, right? <laughs> Penny Arcade. Any of that stuff. More people read Penny Arcade than Justice League. Uh, a friend of mine, Larry Susan, is a, a strip called The Least I Could Do. Yeah. He has oh. 750,000 unique readers every day. He outsells everyone in the comic well, industry. Well, sells. Well, outreads right. anyway. He has a larger audience than everyone in the comic industry five times over. Yeah. And yet he's not a household word the way right, right. You know, the guys we, are We started business. serializing Skull Kickers online, and we've opened up a whole new audience that's trying the book. So I've got uh, three trade paperbacks in print with image. But if you go to the skullkickers.com website, you see a little link there that says read it for free. You can read the first two trade paperbacks for free. It hasn't hurt our sales a lick. We, 25 times our print sales, we have an online audience. And if even one small percentage of that starts to buy the books or buys it from Amazon or buys it from the convention, it's a, it's a net positive. So, so if we, if we want to finish on one note, it's uh, stop publishing comics. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that what the, the we'll reality is, is that, what, that, that the whole industry is changing. The publishing Very much is changing, yeah. and uh, artistry and creating is changing, and the legitimacy that used to come with the gatekeepers of publishing is not so cut and dry anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a, a really key thing here is, is you look at the market right now, you've got Marvel and DC in this kind of weird little like, uh, death struggle. Because uh, DC's in Pod Far right now, and they're, 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 and they're cutting each other up. And, but we're standing outside watching the circle, and we're thinking, "There's our industry." Uh, some of us are inside, hoping we have a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just it. It's like there are two guys competing against each other, doing superheroes, and all the success stories that we're talking about outside of what Marvel and DC are doing aren't superheroes. Okay. There's a larger market outside. We're so insulated inside comics for so long 
think of that Marvel and DC are the perimeter of what makes good popular comics. Do you really good popular comics have nothing to do with superheroes? Actually, the thing that surprises most people is if you ask in general what the best selling comic of the 21st century was, most people wouldn't even be able to guess, which was Shonen Jump, which was selling upwards of a half a million copies every month for about eight or nine years. Half a million. Half a million. No, 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 six million. At its height, it was selling six million a week. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, I would perhaps just see the comic stories that they were doing the half million, but they were so far and ahead of everything that Marvel and DC did times five. And when I bring that up, you know, people say, how do we get comics to go back to being high top selling magazines before I go, well, they exist, they do right now. Dragon Ball Z and their Pokemon were selling in the millions. And they would always go, well, those don't count. As though somehow, because they are sequential stories with pictures and words, but nobody wears capes, it's all on well, There's a reason why both the New York Times uh, and the Amazon started to have a separate manga list, and that Diamond separated their manga sales charts. Because if they didn't, Marvel and DC would have looked like fools. Because you would have been like, okay, Naruto, 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 One Piece, One Piece, One Piece, One Piece, Bleach, Bleach, Bleach. Oh, there's... The top selling superhero comic <laughs> at right. number 26 yeah. or whatever. Like, that's the reality of that. And the market. sad part is, most of the people who work in the comics shop and work in the comics industry don't even know this. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, it, it's really apparent. Like, like, what are the comic characters that most people actually know? Superman, Batman, Snoopy, Teenage uh, Turtles. Teenage Turtles. Yeah. Calvin and Hobbes, even though it hasn't been published for like 20 years. Okay, we're, we're talking about what, what really gets into public consciousness isn't. Guys wearing their underwear, beating up I another disagree, guy. I disagree with that. I mean, The Avengers is the, the Avengers biggest, is one biggest movie of all time. All time so. I, yeah, that, no, 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 that's, that's different, though, because what they're doing is selling essentially is another Star Wars franchise using intellectual property. I don't think people they're selling those. They're not selling comics. Yeah, but people know those characters. It's not like they, they're showing up because they've never heard of Captain America. I mean, come on. I, I would actually, I, I would actually argue that half the people that go to a movie within the first. Well, that argument won't be happening here. <laughs> Sorry, because <laughs> we have, because we have wrapped up, we have wrapped up for the full hour, and uh, I, I'd like to thank my guests first off for not punching each other, which usually happens on these episodes. Right after the <laughs> well, we all just got into the scalp. We're going to talk finish. Uh, and uh, I would like very much to thank the Dragon Lady for. Oh my God. <laughs> Exist and we can have this Amazing. first anniversary. And thank you very much for hosting us. This was the only with Tim. So elegant.